šlo. Thank you very much. I'll address you in Portuguese. And I think it's just because it will be much better for all of us that I speak Portuguese. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure and honor to be here with so many friends and get to meet new friends because we always keep in touch, even if remotely. But uh, what we do is always a source of insight. But I'm sorry to say that there are some setbacks in the field of policy for human rights at an international level because of the economic crisis, the lack of specific regulations of the financial market. This somehow has curved our fight for human rights. And so we need to fight back against those setbacks. We need to know that there are some times where we need to push forward. And some other times what we have to do is prevent setbacks from happening and prevent our progress to be taken from us. I'll refer to universal jurisdiction in the fight, in the fight against uh, impunity, including Friends Against Humanity, specifying the Brazilian case, which somehow makes us reflect upon the reach and boundaries of law in these crimes against humanity. By the way, I'm pretty sure that theory on uni uh, universal jurisdiction is a conquest by civilization. In order to fit into the time that I have left, I will only use my final slide. The theory of universal jurisdiction is the result of accumulated hard work after decades of having a critical awareness in the fight against all offenses against humanity. This concept of universal jurisdiction started in 49 with the Geneva Convention and also with the protocols from 67, where it says that states have the legal obligation to prosecute and pursue those individuals that are suspected to have been the, the insiders, the perpetrators of those criminals. And they need to be brought to trial, regardless of their nationality or the place of execution of the crime or crime commission. And this is very important because the states are obliged to know, to find out those crimes. And as soon as they find out, they need to bring them to justice. And I think this is also a basis for international entities and bodies and mechanisms. And that's why people need to understand universal jurisdiction for all the crimes that are covered in international treaties, such as protection of uh, cultural heritage, or in case of an armed conflict, a com committee against torture or other cruel or degrading crimes. Back in 84, the International Convention for the Protection of All all people against enforced disappearances. This universal jurisdiction also draws on the common law that states are entitled to, whereby all um, jurors have such a right. And that's where we've seen most of the setbacks recently. When we started our discussions, well, we also need to recall that uh, universal jurisdiction is the only way to try and fight against crimes. And so it should not be seen as a one-off process. It is part, it belongs with a larger system that tries to enlarge those lobbying measures, and so we need to prevent international crimes, crimes from happening. Universal jurisdiction is not replacing national jurisdictions in any cases, because there are different mechanisms to pursue and prosecute uh, 
perpetrators and help victims. But it is also paramount that states and organizations are committed to enlarging national powers so that their states are entitled to guarantee full cooperation and legal assistance when prosecuting these international crimes. Fight against impunity is also to be based on the enforcement of national law according to the needs in order to prosecute those that have clearly broken the law and have committed serious offences. And that's why we need to advocate universal jurisdiction as a principle and also as a lawful mechanism against impunity, which does not mean being a critical about its limitations, whether those limitations are financial, legal, practical, or of any other kind, because it's also true that policy, diplom diplomacy, economic interests, financial interests that tend to be turned into theory going against universal jurisdiction, it also troubles them and it has some limitations. As global governance mechanisms and in the pursuit of protecting people. So advocating, promoting universal jurisdiction is not leaving all other jurisdictions aside or forgetting about criminal law or international criminal law. International criminal law is not the one bullet, the, 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 the silver bullet f solution for all problems, but this is the minimal level in the fight against those crimes that endanger the existence of human beings. This is the minimum amount of law and it needs to be an attempt to preserve the existence of humankind. But it is also true that weakening the theory of universal jurisdiction entails weakening the idea of crimes against humanity. Universal jurisdiction, it is based on the fact that the crime was committed against all humankind. Recently, we've seen how the, the, the duty of memory takes us down memory lane and how we need to recall what happened before because we've seen how policy resorts to concentration camps and political assassination on a constant basis. Walter Benjamin, by the way, knew that a policy to achieve his goals means sacrificing part of humankind. Fundamentalisms, extremisms, which are so fashionable nowadays, are ethnical expressions that turn to concentration camps to solve the problems with minorities or political or religious divergences. And this is a problem when differences are not tolerated, because in these cases they try to have homogeneous, even cultures. And that is why, even more important than sharing the limits of universal jurisdiction, we need to know, we need to learn what it means in moral, political and ethical terms. We are obliged to remember what happened before. And this is started with the Holocaust. And it means that we are obliged to rethink it all. We need to think of policy, of science, and politics, and even law itself, based on the barbaric acts that lie with our experience. The barbaric history started on victims, on the suffering of the weakest. If we want to build history in a different way, we need to take our past seriously. Unless we want to repeat history over and over again, we need to take it serious. We need to think of universal jurisdiction. Manuel Marisman, a Spanish professor, mentioned that when we forget our memories, we feel more comfortable. And that's why the theory of universal jurisdiction means that it is very that we feel comfortable because we remember and we take it seriously. Why? Because we want efficient replies to have a repair, reparation justice. And that's how we have diplomatic uh, 
diplomatic conflicts and even makes it more difficult to handle international conflicts. That's the traditional way. But there are other ways to prevent barbarism and barbaric acts from happening again. And so, this is part of a gear and a structure that is based on international cooperation. It's based on international systems for the protection of human rights, international courts, meetings, conventions and treaties, all international in their nature. We in Brazil, we are trying to take memories seriously. And in order to do so, we need to rethink our political transition from a dictatorship towards democracy. And so that we can be just and fair to our past. And so I move on to the second part of my presentation about the limitations of pardons and amnesties in this field of international justice. This, uh, our case is quite quite pretty similar to this Spanish case. We have a, a transition justice where there is no justice. And pardons and amnesties in Brazil has had quite an impact. This idea of amnesty, of pardon in Brazil is all, uh, still being discussed. People tend to ask, how come? How can you explain the fact that in Brazil, contrary to the reality in other uh, Latin American countries, on top of pardon as an impunity standard, because it's still in place, because it's been only 50 years after the coup that had back, the military coup that had back in 64, and it is now that we finally have a, com a truth committee. I'll try to explain some of the theories that we've concluded for the last five years based on the idea that the remedial activities for victims is one of the pillars for transition, trying to promote what we know as transition rights. We try and explain the ambiguity of the pardon law in Brazil, which has a legacy and consequences that are still questioned, which, by the way, entails a paradox of our general victory which is also translated into different pardon concessions in Brazil. On the one hand, it's understood as forgetting, as impunity. And then some other people read it as a, a repair, a, a compensation, a reparation, or an opportunity. This pardon law during the military regime, that was our legal system, that was the basis for the redemocratization of the country. And here we find our pardon, and that's where the transition started. Pardon understood as forgetting, as impunity, as advocated by the military regime and their supporters, which was a basic element for the last years. This idea of pardon or amnesty advocated by civil society back in the 70s, amnesty or pardon as freedom, which was further developed during democratization and that was then consolidated as the idea of remedy, of reparation, as we find it in our constitution from 78. It is also important to highlight current state of transition justice in Brazil where we find new social movements that have clear requests that lodge claims before the Inter-American Human Rights Court and also our Supreme Court, and together with our federal public office trying to demand the creation of a truth commission. These current elements, in accordance with the analysis that I suggested, consolidate a social mindset where amnesty, where pardon is understood as freedom, as liberty, and also as a remedy or reparation, which in turn led to the arrival of a third stage of our fight for amnesty in Brazil which is also part of our understanding of amnesty or pardon, closer to the idea of justice, to the idea of truth. Those approaches somehow alter, disturb 
to superstitions of amnesty as impunity or oblivion. This amnesty that it's been enforced by dictatorships, understanding its political meaning, its legal meaning, amnesty in history, in Brazil's history, leads us to the idea of problems within dictatorship and also political resistance that took place back in the 70s after the coup that had the military coup that had in 64 which was based on social approaches and that's where we find some <coughs> assistance movements and resistance movements sometimes even armed resistance which was promoted by the cold war but used retaliation against these resistance movements which in turn led to a state policy that was terror-based, trying to get rid of all those members, extermination of the members, and also extermination of those left-wing politicians with a countless number of people affected that were brought to prison because of random decisions in the, in the private and public sector, and countless people who saw their political rights annulled, overridden, and that were forced into clandestine living because of the censorship, dictatorship, and also because of enforced uh, disappearances and executions. And it, it was a social movement for political amnesty, and we find it ever since the beginning of the mili military dictatorship in Brazil. A movement for pardon, for amnesty, that was disseminated in society through military members that stayed in our national territory and also used student movements and university movements and other movements that together with the working classes gave way to one of the greatest social movements in the Republican history because it, it was the rule of law, it was law and order trying to advocate a wide, a general amnesty for all political crimes committed by the resistance against the dictatorship. This is a stage that is known as the first fight for amnesty in Brazil, trying to recover public freedoms, civil freedoms and political freedoms. And so in social terms, the idea of a pardon or amnesty in Brazil comes closer to the idea of freedom, judging by the history that led to its approval in Brazil. Such wide popular mobilization around a pro-amnesty fight forced the dictatorship to change their opposing activity against amnesty. So it entailed a conquest uh, by civil society, and so it also entailed the first defeat of the dictatorship in a control Congress that enforced a bilateral excluding amnesty where blood crimes are excluded, blood crimes by the resistance. That's the historical process where we find ambiguity. That's what we find in Brazil, which seems a paradox of our general popular victory. Because on the one hand, dictatorship imposed a restricted amnesty on society because it was convenient for them, including some doubtful mechanisms which were not logic-based. And then, on the other hand, civil society got its most significant result in a fight against the military regime trying to change the ratio of social powers. And so the military forces had to pass a new amnesty passed in 79. That's when Brazil recovered some political rights, issued and granted freedom to some political prisoners achieve the arrival of exilates 
then also public officials were readmitted those that had been expelled before and somehow it allowed us to rescue the, the identity of those people that were forced into clandestine living and so these basic freedom rights and measures together with the first remedial measures lead to a situation where we can restart democratization of the country, opening, political opening of the country. The law passed back in 79, even if restricted, was one of the foundational pillars of the redemocratization of our country. And that's when, that's in that process, where we built our new process based on the enforcement of the law in 79. So it was an, an, a double agreement from a legal point of view, which has a concomitant reach, where we see the political crimes of resistance and also the state crimes regarding political crimes. In political terms, we find a commission which is unquestionable for reconciliation and still needs to be discussed and nuanced. On the one hand, we need to take into account the deficit of legitimacy. National Congress that passed the amnesty law was limited. Not all MPs had been chosen by citizens vote and secondly cannot forget that when we say free opposition during the dictatorship actually we are referring to a cons to an agreed opposition they, they were not free political parties many of the political parties did not take part because it was not until after amnesty the door was opened to the lawful entry of some political parties. So they were not peers, they were not equal. On the one hand, we had uh, politicians and their arms, and then we had the criminalized population that was had their hands tied by the law. And when there, there is a bilateral amnesty, which was a prerequisite for the democratization of the country, that's when we discover that it had been, they had been authoritarian, that it had been political blackmail. That's when we see that there is a limited amnesty that can only be at, uh, allowed if it's based on, imp on impunity. So what we see is the following. We find some political agreements from the authoritarian history, which might mean that we are further away from human rights and democracy. And so they do not try to delegitimize the political fight of all those people who have used what was legal back then and fought for the approval of a new law. But somehow we need to place it in a context. Um, I mean, the time that they were fighting. So we need to think of the contingency of transition and limitations of transition and limitations of a transitional justice, which all it all contributes to the agreements for the opposition, which was a limited and agreed upon opposition and so it cannot be historically translated into a, a a wide social agreement and that's and hence that's when we see that it is necessary to have a wide a broad based amnesty that needs to be put forward by civil society so it's not just about amnesty for both sides even pol pol uh, decision makers might have thought that the law from 79 was a bilateral law, but that's not the case. It is based on ambiguity. The paradox of the victory of all people, well, it becomes even more patent in our Brazilian history. And after the enforcement of such amnesty, the redemocratization movement did not touch 
those in power, but there are different marches asking for elections in civil society, and that's when, once again, military dictatorship shows its force, trying to get rid of the bill of the draft for direct elections for the first civilian president chosen after the dictatorship. And so, we find a new fight for amnesty in history, and we find ourselves in a bit more democratic situation, trying to find a, a new president for the Republic. That, that was a time of political agreement. That's when we had a cabinet where we had the head of the opposition as vice president, and also a vice, uh, that was the president, and the vice president was from the military regime. In, back in 81, that was the end of the Argentinian dictatorship, but our transition in Brazil has been controlled, it's been limited. It was properly articulated. We They found a way out because somehow they had this self-amnesty, trying to keep it away from problems. And that's when they called for indirect elections to guarantee the continuity of the political project. And after the destruction of the archives, to get rid of all proof of responsibility of all those breaches and violations, well, I think this shows the three pillars of the control and uh, self-limiting transition in Brazil. How crimes went unpunished based on a political agreement for mutual pardon. Secondly, it is an attempt on, on of Libyan trying to delete, to get rid of the past or the impunity of the retaliation agents, which is an aggravating factor for the mutation of the concept of amnesty as we find it during the Democratic Assembly. But there was an amendment, a constitutional amendment by the military board in 69. Such an amendment confirmed amnesty within the scope of the law from 79 and led to the constitution in 88, the, the constitutional amnesty, sorry, in 88, which in turn confirmed an ambiguous <coughs> amnesty according to the document and there's something else this constitutional amendment that led to the constitutional amnesty should it be understood as a weakening of the governing power i know this is legal in its nature it is a legal question but somehow can we achieve such amendment that led to the constitutional amnesty and which forecast it as a prior limitation. Actually, regardless of the name we give it, the governing power in Brazil was independent and as a result, the constitutional process became an open social debate space, an amnesty debate. What happened? Well, Brazilian constitution from 88 included the same terms for ambiguous and bilateral amnesty. Actually, it did not include the exact terms, but Another mechanism where it said that amnesty would be granted to those that were covered by the update. So the constitution from 88 left aside those prosecuted but did not take care of the perpetrators. So somehow the constitution confirmed this indeterminate reparation or remedy, saying that all those covered by the update should be should get remedial actions by the democratic state. 
And we find a second mutation of the concept of amnesty in Brazilian history that comes closer to the idea of amnesty as, as, as freedom claimed by society, but also as a remedy or reparation for all those that had been affected by exceptions. And so our Brazilian amnesty, it's a constitutional amnesty. So by constitution regulation, Brazil needs to create two uh, uh, reparation uh, commissions. Both commissions need to be created uh, or need to rec admit the existence of victims in, this, in history. Furthermore, both commissions need to admit the serious violations against human beings perpetrated against members of the resistance during the military dictatorship. Hence, a first immediate result of this uh, uh, remedy program that has a finally uh, contemplating state violence uh, can be engaged. In a less immediate way, uh, reparation committees will uh, create uh, um, a new uh, form of uh, truer history to aid transactional or transition mechanisms, including uh, the um, registries and records of violence that will be part of the evidence in uh, remedy trials. And the rescue of uh, historical memory of victims to promote uh, education and human rights throughout the whole country. In the historical component, these uh, uh, remedies and uh, these actions against oblivion will be another step against the mechanisms of, re of uh, repression, not only against victims, but also against their memories. In uh, a new uh, framework of uh, social construction on the existence or the, a new awareness of these uh, violations and crimes. And they, uh, they must be part of the new agenda of, uh, uh, or in the struggle for amnesty in Brazil. And in uh, developing this uh, remedy process by transmitting memory and truth, the second step into that path will be the moment in which amnesty is admitted as remedy and memory. And in that stage, uh, there must be an open, direct debate within society, particularly in the field of possible public projects and policies to promote such memory. The Amnesty Commission, one of the Remedy Commissions, started off in 2007 along a new path which is uh, debating the significance of this historical mechanism in public data. Uh, public uh, apologies have been uh, given to all those that have suffered political persecution in what we call amnesty caravans. This project in Brazil was but a political gesture made by the state and addressed to uh, pardon uh, citizens that had been framed into the um, political uh, significance of uh, crimes. So uh, citizen, uh, or things have changed into citizens pardoning or forgiving their government for the crimes committed against them. Today, an official action of recognition of the legitimate right of citizens to demand uh, remedy against uh, oppression and authoritarianism. In 2010, the families of those dead or disappeared 
conquered a further episode in this battle where the verdict of the International Court of Law for Human Rights determining that the Brazilian state was to suspend all political obstacles to the, pro to the right to protection of victims and their families, even in the penal realm. And uh, Brazil was declared as a self-amnesty incompatible with uh, the protection of human rights, particularly in the most serious cases of violations of human rights. Obviously, in this second stage of the struggle for amnesty, uh, both the uh, remedy commissions and the uh, political actions to promote memory and truth in, or broaden the number of social actors in get engaged in this uh, process for justice. The families of those dead and disappeared, different political movements, uh, uh, civil movements, uh, workers' movements, and uh, many other uh, similar movements. Social awareness on the recent past is uh, the main uh, task of these uh, commissions. And they need to revolve around the strategy for exiting the dictatorial regime. Is it truly possible to forget such serious value, uh, violations? And in the same way, uh, the second foundation of this strategy stemming from the dictatorial regime was uh, uh, looking into the future and not into the past. And uh, this uh, leaves only the dimension of impunity based on the judicial uh, interpretation of the uh, legal amnesty of 1979. The uh, political crimes detected or uh, stated by the uh, dictatorship is based on individual perpetration of uh, violent crimes. And the other one is the legal uh, or the possible legal uh, implementation of measures against those perpetrators. On the first <coughs> area, Brazil has incorporated a national commission for truth. That was a theoretical step forward. The remedy commissions were granted the recognition of facts and the placement of the acts uh, or the existence of the abstract responsibility or liability of the Brazilian state on these crimes. And the second step would be systematizing uh, pun punishment uh, to these crimes and identifying individuals responsible for such uh, crimes. Hence, in 2010, the uh, Supreme Court of Brazil denied pro uh, direct protection of victims, thus hiding the facts uh, and covering up uh, crimes committed during the dictatorship. Today, Brazil, or in that moment, Brazil uh, went uh, uh, or followed a different path from the tradition of the rest of Latin America of truth and justice. There is no truth and justice and uh, in, in a state with such totalitarianism. In uh, 2005, a new uh, legislation was approved to recognize and admit the, uh, the a faculty of the International uh, Court of Law on Human Rights to uh, rule on specific cases. Uruguay, for instance, had a verdict against the government for crimes against the citizens, including murder and disappearances. Peru tried and sentenced Fujimori, Guatemala, open trial uh, on genocide against uh, their dictator. These are actions that express to their uh, to the country society that uh, law is the same for all, even those who have the power to manipulate their own position and to influence the political spheres and to cover up for their own crimes. This is an idea in which a democratic state is made liable for what they do and for what a terrorist state might do. 
The Latin American perspective of transition justice is conceived on the uh, feature of complementarity, meaning that truth, memory, justice, and remedy are uh, crossed elements that are overlaid and interdependent. For instance, the right to truth entirely depends on the right of action to these commissions of uh, truth and remedy within the justice uh, system to reach the very layers of social justice. For Latin America, having such a broad history in the consolidation of state and law, it is particularly important that the judicial system participates in the process of the democratization of, of society and institutions. And this involves a set of uh, authority case law frameworks that cannot, uh, that cannot be broken. While in the European field, this is based on the very construction of the justice system, we still need to struggle for it. Cer certain uh, differences are relevant, particularly this uh, intra-regional distinctions, cooperation between uh, justice institutions among Latin American states has been called upon for the promotion of justice. And the position of Brazil uh, in uh, these terms is but a reflection of the regional uh, approach. In other Latin American countries, perpetrators have migrated to Brazilian territory. And their situation depends on the legal interpretation Brazil makes on its own legislation on amnesty. Today, we're going through a moment where new social movements are seeking truth and justice. These movements are similar to others that emerged in Argentina and Chile, and which are uh, directly in connection with the amnesty law, demanding the full implementation of the uh, of the International uh, Court of Law of Human Rights verdicts or rulings in cases of crimes against humanity. If in the if in the first stage of the struggle for amnesty movements were struggling for truth, in this second stage, social movements included. Uh, remedy and memory, and uh, they are now moving even forward in the agenda for transition, going into one third stage in the struggle for amnesty and demanding also truth and justice. Just as other previous, previous movements, uh, these movements uh, remain uh, focused uh, not on the amnesty attempts made in the decade of the 70s, but actually pointing forward towards justice and truth in a legislation that will exclude the effects of uh, serious state crimes from uh, the amendment of, uh, nine, of 79. These movements are seeking a new approach, not similar to those of Argentina, but to those of, of uh, Chile. Uh, legal amnesty includes, uh, or cannot include, amnesty for serious violations against, uh, uh, against uh, human rights. Several other Latin American countries have combined different uh, historical factors social factors like the social mobilization around the subject, or political factors typical of coalition mechanisms and the difficulty of composition uh, of uh, um, uh, state programs. And also uh, in decision with the, uh, with the ruling of the Supreme Court on the bilaterality of the 1979 uh, amendment. The main obstacle is, that the, uh, is the interpretation given to this legislation by the Supreme Court of Brazil that made their ruling based on three premises. One, that amnesty in the, in the Brazilian constitution can be bilateral. They did not want uh, to uh, treat self-amnesty as other countries in the region have. And also the principle of uh, the, how uh, crimes against humanity are described. And finally, since this is a reconciliation law, it should be, uh, or the 
legislative power should be in power to modify it or amend it. These premises used by the Supreme Court provide uh, a comparison between the processes going on in Brazil and in Spain. Uh, Spain is quoted as a model of transition through transformation. We see uh, that ruling in a critical way also for three reasons. First, because the Supreme Court admi admitted that uh, the regime that ended in 1964, that there are elements uh, that are fundamental in the state of law. Second, they considered as legitimate the uh, supposed political pact and the amnesty law that aimed to include a set of criminal activities and extract them from the sphere of legal powers. And third, and consequentially as a practical after effect, the, uh, this uh, ruling denied protection to citizens whose rights have been, had been violated during the exercise of this inconstitutionality. We see the, the difficulty in making or creating a compatibility in reconciling the ruling of the Supreme Court that considered the 1979 law as bilateral and make it compatible with the ruling of the Inter-American Court of Law that declared those legal obstacles as null and void in the case of serious violations against human rights based on the Uruguay case. The decision of the Brazilian Supreme Court admitted the uh, law of amnesty and the constitutional amendment as uh, pillars of the uh, democratic state of law in Brazil and demanded that uh, both uh, sides uh, received remedy in the same action involving that the regime would be uh, both punishing and forgiving itself in matters of human rights after the ruling of the Inter-American uh, Court. This uh, decision is uh, formally valid in the legal case law of Brazil and in its democracy, leading to the perception today that it's still too early to know whether this third stage of social action in terms of or, uh, leading to amnesty in Brazil is actually necessary to uh, create this state of law. The core fact remains that only the action and mobilization of civil society can actually uh, make any action effective. In Brazil, actually, we have two recent pieces of news. The first one is that the federal court of law admitted a claim of our federal uh, ministry to investigate high-ranking military officials in the Ucentro case. It was a bomb a terrorist attack in, seven, in 1978. And second, the federal public ministry uh, has uh, pointed or uh, made uh, liable certain officials for the death of an official called Omics Viber. And we cannot forget the ruling of the Inter-American Court, which is still valid. And therefore, in its stage of implementation, and the Brazilian state needs to uh, be made accountable to this court of law on the implementation or uh, application of this ruling. In conclusion, in the experience of certain Latin American countries, the fact or uh, that people have no doubt as to the functionality of their legal system as a functional element uh, to struggle against crimes against uh, humanity is a need. And how this transition is implemented with <clears throat> a, a conflict between the concept of amnesty and impunity. Any action harming humanity must be punished, and people have, need to have the right to be protected at any moment and anywhere based on 
uh, the principle of uh, universal justice. Perhaps Latin America is not going through its longest democratical uh, processes, and it's going through interruptions and uh, uh, and hiccups. Yet, the word justice does not have a plural in any language. So, it seems clear that any crime against humanity uh, cannot prescribe. And uh, a basic law of amnesty can aid promote the protection of human rights around the world. Somehow, I believe that this is the uh, main ethical legacy of Nuremberg and the main ethical uh, legacy of uh, Mr. Garzon as well. We have the right and the duty to preserve our conditions to uh, safeguard human rights in our countries. Thank you. You said that we need to remember the past to enhance a present justice and to create universal justice. So the question is, what can we do when governments, such as the government of Spain today, have no interest whatsoever in remembering the past? What to do? Well, I am in fact convinced that memory is the best weapon against barbarism. In this sense, the struggle for the uh, reaffirmation of this memory is a necessary, or a necessarily uh, uh, leaves society bare naked. So these conservatives that have no interest in exposing themselves and in having the social uh, functions they played revealed to the public who do not want to be transparent about the profit they made during these dictatorial regimes uh, would not be interested in allowing such law. But I believe that the sole way out is social mobilization. Our capability of mobilizing to generate the possibility to provide visibility to these victims so that this visibility, this knowledge of serious crimes against those people can be known and can in turn generate processes of social integration and the possibility that different social sectors can be moved in favor of a public agenda for the exercise of historical memory. Interestingly enough, in the case of Brazil, the uh, implementation of the remedy program and the constitutions or, or the commission set up by the state ended up in providing more visibility to victims and uh, further internal forces could be uh, gathered to favor these uh, victims of crimes of the past. And this program, this memory program in terms of uh, remedy, was heavily inspired by the, uh, by the Spanish law on historical memory. At a certain point in Brazil, follow-up was given to the statement and implementation of such policies as an instrument of mobilization and dissemination of a, a, a more critical thought in society in terms of rejecting crimes against humanity. So uh, we were uh, looking up to Spain at that time, and I can say that in 2007, this historical memory act that was approved here in Spain was taken as a model for inspiration that in the end led to the new social mobilization we're witnessing in Brazil and which has led to a new approach in Brazil in, within its uh, political transaction uh, transition. Una pregunta para Paulo Abrao, Abrao también hay bastantes pero Another question for Paulo we have plenty of questions for you but not a lot of time you uh, referred to the uh, incidents of financial dictatorship on impunity, on non-prescribing crimes. 
and the uh, dignity of millions of human beings. The question is, can the principle of aggression crimes be applied to vital economic or, eco or ecological crimes? That is a huge question. Obviously, it will depend on the very dynamics of the international community and on how the present crisis be administered in the future. I, one thing I am convinced of is that our democracies have been captured by the market. There is a strong infiltration and dangerous infiltration of economic sectors in our political, democratic political structures. And uh, this uh, affects the uh, uh, <clears throat> public interest by basically private interests. And this uh, is done by uh, berating politics as a, a fundamental element of social relations. And uh, this uh, process of berating has uh, led many young people into skepticism towards politics. And perhaps part of the criticism is based on the excess of political pragmatism. But we also we also need to take into account at least uh, three factors. The first one, the end of the false conflict between state and market, and uh, the recognition of both spheres as complementary and not conflictive. Second, the need of going deeper into democratization processes, not only for institutions, but also for social relations, using even uh, whatever mechanisms new technologies make available, and uh, which we have not used yet to uh, broaden democracy as a fundamental right. And third, the broadening and progressive uh, acknowledgment of new rights knowing that even in the most advanced societies, democracy is not an end but a means. It's a process. And new rights will keep rising to be acknowledged and guaranteed. When this happens, we're going from a good model to a better model for social, inclu uh, for social inclusion and for the acknowledgement of individuals as the protagonists of institutions. Outside of these alternatives, we will continue to uh, see this illegitimate process of uh, markets taking uh, over the state.